You remember the Han exhibition, and there were various w videos of women waving their arms in these great silk sleeves floating in the air. She also was very adept at the sword dance, like you might see in uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. She doesn't jump from bamboo pole to bamboo pole, but she's quite adept at that. She said it's dancing with a sword is sort of like dancing with a partner, uh, but more dangerous, perhaps. Um, her employment, so after she got her PhD from uh, Berkeley, she uh, taught at uh, UC Davis in the College of William and Mary before uh, going to University of Michigan. Uh, she is working on another book, uh, Dancing East Asia, Choreographies and Politics. She's a specialist in Chinese dance and performance culture with broader interests in 20th century history, transnationalism, gender, and social movements. Please give a warm welcome to Emily Wilcox. I'm sure she's going to sweep you off your feet. Wow, I think that was um, the best introduction anyone's ever given for me. So thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I wanted to also thank um, Professor Pat Berger for inviting me to give this talk and also all the organizers at the museum and to all of you for making this possible. It's such a huge treat. Um, as you heard, I did my PhD at Berkeley, so I spent a lot of time here in the museum coming to events and learning, and I learned a lot at this museum. And I think um, it's just such an honor to be back here in this capacity today. So thank you again. Um, as you heard from the introduction, my primary area of research is on dance in China in the 20th century. Um, so this talk is pushing me a little outside of my comfort zone. However, almost all of the dances that I research have roots in um, this earlier period and specifically in the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty is regarded as the high point of Chinese dance historically. It's what people always refer back to when they're talking about the glorious history of Chinese dance. And there are many specific uh, figures and specific dances that actually get re-choreographed constantly in contemporary dance choreography today. So it's been um, a pleasure to be able to look at some of the source material that that, that is inspired by. So I'm going to start out with um, a film clip from a film that came out in 2015 about um, the famous Chinese consort, uh, Yang Guifei. Nadi 他该是真假的人。And we'll come back to talk about some of the dance movements that you just saw in a little bit. Um, but first of all, who is Yang Guifei and why is she dancing in this film? 
Um, so Yang Guifei, um, Guifei means honored consort. It's a very specific title that was given to consorts of the emperor that were um, favored. And Yang Guifei was. She was originally married to um, the emperor's son, but he took such a liking to her that somehow it was arranged for her to be released from her marriage and transferred to a Taoist temple um, on the palace grounds. And then ultimately she entered the emperor's harem. And this was around 745 CE. Um, Yang Guifei is also famous for her death. Um, she was actually murdered um, on the command of the soldiers who felt that she had um, distracted the emperor to such an extent that he couldn't care for his regime. And as a result, there was a, a rebellion that took place um, that caused almost uh, the fall of the Tang Dynasty. And so as a result of the rebellion, Yang Guifei was ordered to be strangled to death. And there have been many stories about her, not only in China, but also in many other parts of Asia, including Korea and Japan. There's even the legend that she was supposed to be murdered, um, but she wasn't actually murdered. And in fact, she um, was swept away and ended up um, somewhere potentially in Japan. People have claimed her in many places. There are references to her story in the Tale of Genji. There are references to her story in many, many poems. And we'll be looking at some of those poems today. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to start with Yang Guifei is not only because she was famous um, for being this um, culprit in theory for the, the downfall of the, the, the Tang Dynasty, but also she was known for her dancing, um, but also her life in a way um, can symbolize some of the intercultural interactions that we'll be talking about today. So if you look at the story here, one of the key figures is An Lu Shan, who you can see from the slide um, was actually of Sogdian and Turkic uh, ethnic background. And he had a Sogdian name, uh, Rakshan. So this story, this intertwining story with the Tang Emperor, the consort, and the Sogdian general um, shows the inseparability of the history of China and the Central Asian kingdoms, one of the most influential of with, which was Sogdiana during this period. Also, these legends of her escape to Japan in some ways symbolize many stories that are still told today about how Tang Dynasty dance, although it died out in China because it changed, it got replaced by Chinese opera, it got replaced by all different types of performance forms. Um, some of the dance forms that are still practiced in Korea and Japan are actually considered to be the only living descendants of Tang Dynasty dance. So in the same way that Yang Guifei supposedly died in China but lived on in, in Japan and Korea, in many ways Tang Dynasty dance still lives on in, in Korea and Japan. Um, and many people very clearly claim this heritage to be the ones um, preserving Tang Dynasty dance for posterity. Um, so let's go back to Yang Guifei's story for a few more minutes. So after her tragic death, there was a famous poem written, Chang Hun Ge. Raise your hand if you've heard of Chang Hun Ge. Um, it's a very famous poem um, that's often recycled in Chinese dramas, um, even television, television series. And it was written long after her death, but it commemorated the love between her and Tang Xuanzong, the emperor. Um, who, patron, who, who was her patron. And in that um, poem, there's actually a reference to a specific dance that Yang Guifei was said to have performed that's gonna be one of the two dances that we really look at carefully today. So here's a quote, it's a very long poem, we're only looking at one short section of it. Um, the cloud of her hair, petal of her cheek, gold ripples of her crown when she moved, were sheltered on spring evenings by warm hibiscus curtains. But nights of spring were short, and the sun arose too soon. And the emperor, from that time forth, forsook his early hearings and lavished all his time on her with feasts and revelry. His mistress of the spring, his despot of the night. There were other ladies in his court, 3,000 of rare beauty, but his favors to 3,000 were centered on one body. By the time she was dressed in her golden chamber, it would be almost evening. And when tables were cleared in the Tower of Jade, she would loiter slow with wine. So this part of the poem um, hasn't gotten to the dance yet, but it gives you a sense of um, her importance to the emperor. Among these many, many thousands of women, she was um, the one that he preferred. 
Um, there's a famous story in which the, the emperor would go to such lengths to um, satisfy her every whim that he would require that the soldiers would not just ride but gallop um, to deliver the lychees for her so that she could have the lychees when they were still fresh. Um, and this got recorded in one of these many poems about Yang Guifei. And the poet wrote, gazing back at Chang'an, that's the capital of the Tang Dynasty at the time, the distance turned into folds of tapestry. On the mountaintops, a thousand palace doors opened one after the other. The red dust stirred up by one ride, made the imperial concubine smile, as who else knew that lychees were on the way? Um, one of the deep things that connected Yang Guifei and the emperor um, was their shared love for the arts. Uh, this is a depiction by a Japanese artist um, many centuries later. Um, but they were, they were both um, very concerned with the palace arts, including both music and dance. And Tang Xuanzong actually is known to have carefully selected individual dancers for the court performing um, bureaus. And he also composed music and dance, um, some of which Yang Guifei performed. And she was known for playing the pipa. Um, a lute shaped, a uh, pear shaped lute instrument that was actually imported from Central Asia um, around this time and centuries earlier. So there's a poem that's attributed to Yang Guifei actually writing about another dancer that helps to indicate her interest in dance. Um, and it, it says, silken sleeves stirring with incessant fragrance, red lotus lilies waving to and fro in the autumn mist. A sudden breeze disperses the gentle clouds resting above the mountains. Delicate willows brush the water by the pool's edge. Um, so that famous dance that I mentioned that Yang Guifei um, was known to perform is this one. It's, it can be pronounced in two ways. The most common pronunciation is Ni Shang Yu Yi Wu. Um, but the second character can also be pronounced Chang Ni Chang Yu Yi Wu. So if we look at the characters here, um, So if you look at this, the second character, um, Shang or Chang, this means usually the bottom half of someone's clothing, a, a skirt or a gown. The first character here, Ni, means um, a double rainbow. Yu means feathers or plumage, and Yi is another word for clothing, but at that time usually meant um, the outer clothing or the upper clothing. So there's actually been numerous um, ways of translating the title of this dance. Um, so it's been translated in all these different ways. Um, but you can see that the heart of the meaning of the dance is that there's some sort of multicolored clothing that either has actual feathers on it or is somehow feather-like. Um, so it's a dance in which there are colors, there are textures like feathers, lightness, um, and the clothing is an essential part of, of the dance. Um, and so here we can see where the actual reference to this dance appears in um, the Song of Everlasting Sorrow, Chang Heng Ge. Um, high rose Lee Palace entering blue clouds, and far and wide the breezes carried magical notes of soft song and slow dance, of string and bamboo music. The emperor's eyes could never gaze on her enough, till war drums booming from Yuyang shocked the whole earth and broke the tunes of the rainbow skirt and feathered coat. So if we stop there for a second, um, we can see that in this poem, the dance is actually serving for this ongoing romance, the li everyday life that's happening in the Tom court. Um, because the, the soldiers marking, marching in, they stop what's happening, and so this dance actually is symbolizing what is being halted, um, life in the Tang Palace, and all this artistic activity that Tang Xuanzong and Yang Guifei have been involved in comes to a halt because of this uh, rebellion. The forbidden city, the nine-tiered palace, loomed in the dust from thousands of horses and chariots headed southwest. The imperial flag opened the way, now moving, now pausing, but 30 miles from the capital, beyond the western gate, the men of the army stopped. Not one of them would stir, till under their horses' hoofs they might trample those moth eyebrows. And here the moth eyebrows refers to Yang Guifei and her beautiful face. Flowery hairpins fell to the ground. No one picked them up. 
in a green and white jade hair tassel and a yellow gold hair bird. The emperor could not save her. He could only cover his face. And later, when he turned to look, the place of blood and tears was hidden in a yellow dust blown by a cold wind. So we know that this dance exists from this poem, but there's also many other references um, to the dance of the Ni Shang Yu Yi Wu. Um, there's actually an entire poem um, by the same poet, Bai Ju Yi, who wrote the Song of Everlasting Sorrow, um, a very famous Tang Dynasty poet. And he has an entire poem that's actually about Ni Shang Yu Yi. Um, however, the poem is actually about the musical structure primarily of um, this performance. And it doesn't give us too much detail about the dance. Um, but I want us to think more about what we could potentially imagine this dance to be like um, based on what we know about its music um, and also the other evidence we have of Tang Dynasty dance. Um, so the poem is, is actually the Ni Shang Yu Yi Ge, or the Song of Ni Shang Yu Yi. And it describes this as a composition um, that was either created or adapted by the emperor, Tang Xuanzong himself, but based on other existing source material. Um, and so this is the first sort of concrete example we have of intercultural ex exchange happening in the performance itself. So we talked about it hypothetically or uh, metaphorically in the rebellion um, in which the Sogdian general is um, having such an intimate role to play in the history of the Tang Dynasty. But here we actually see it in the performance um, form. So scholars of the time who wrote about Ni Shang Yu Yi Wu said that it was um, adapted from a combination of Po Luo Men, um, or the Brahmana. Uh, it's a music and performance form from India. And that this was combined with existing forms of Han um, music and dance that were known as Xian Yue, or immortal music. Um, and this overall, um, the Ni Shang Yu Yi, fell into the category of what's known as Da Qu, or grand songs, or grand music, or grand performance of the Tang Dynasty. And this was a very uh, specialized, very specific performance genre um, that actually started in the Han Dynasty, but it became more and more complex and had a more um, in-text structural um, form in the Tang Dynasty. And so Ni, Ni, Shang, uh, Ni Shang Yu Yi Wu is an example of a grand song. Um, one of the things that is important for us to think about when we think about this specific genre is that you really can't separate dance from music. So when we talk about dance in the 20th century, there are many choreographers who hope to make dance um, so independent that actually it can be performed without music. It's not at all dependent on music. Um, but in this case, in the, in the context of Tang Dynasty China, the music and the dance were actually so interconnected that the same name applied to both. Um, and we can't actually separate. We don't know if Ni Shang Yu Yu is a dance or a song. It's actually both. The composition refers to both. Um, so I think that's the first thing, the first point that we do know about this composition of the Tang Dynasty um, that became so emblematic of Tang Dynasty culture is that somehow it combined instrumental music, singing music and recitation with embodied movement that we today would call dance. So if we think about this interconnected synthetic nature of music and dance in the Tang Dynasty, we actually see this um, depicted in many of the existing archaeological artifacts that document Tang Dynasty performance. And so many of these images are taken from one of the books that's listed on the study guide. Um, it's the, um, the first item that's by the dance historian Wang Kefen. She's one of the most uh, well-respected historians of dance in China today. She's I believe 98 years old now. Um, she's written a number of books, but this one is actually really wonderful because it's bilingual. The book itself is published in both Chinese and English. Um, and she does meticulous uh, research to make sure that the images that she chooses are definitely from the periods that she's looking at. And so um, that's why I decided to use her images for this section. So all of these images are um, materials that come from the Tang Dynasty. And so here you can see um, this collection is very typical. It includes two dancers 
and then three musicians. And you can't really see the musical instruments anymore, but we can guess from the hand actions what types of musical instruments that are being played. So the, the kneeling performer on the left um, looks like she's probably playing a plucked instrument like the jung. Um, the one in the middle looks like she might be playing um, the vertical flute, the xiao. And then the one on the far right looks like she might be playing the mouth organ or the sheng. So we can imagine if we know what those sounds sound like. Um, we can hear the plucking strings, we can hear um, the flute, and then we can hear the mouth organ. Um, while we see these two dancers, who both look to be uh, female, and they have long sleeves, and they have long um, draping uh, scarves coming from the hand. This is something we see in most of the documents of dance during this period. Um, another thing you'll notice is that they're wearing long gowns. So almost all the documentation we have of Tang Dynasty dance um, really doesn't show the legs at all. So it's very different from um, European dance forms that became popular several hundred years later, in which actually such as ballet, for example, the movement of the legs is essential, um, even the most important part of the movement. Um, but in what we can gain from looking at these statues, we can see that actually what's being highlighted are the twisting of the torso, um, the slight turns of the head, and then movements in the arms. So most of the movement is actually happening somehow by twisting the torso and moving the arms. And that becomes the focal point of the dance. And if you think back to the film that we watched, the clip at the very beginning, the woman standing on the pedestal, she almost doesn't move much. She's almost stationary. But all of this dance movement is able to happen um, in this one stationary position through turning, through using the upper body, through using the head and the arms um, simultaneously, and then also by using the clothing. Um, so we can see another example here where we have the musicians and the dancers working together as a synthetic um, orchestration. So again, you see the musicians are kneeling around the edge. You see the dancers here. There's a bit of, um, you can see that the hip is slightly thrust out here. So this is something we'll talk about later. That, this happens during the Tang Dynasty as a, as a result of increased interaction with India. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen Indian statues that have um, the hips out and the head keeping this curved action. Um, so you can see slightly in these statues where that's coming into the dance movement. Um, but again, we see much movement in the arms, much movement in the torsos, the heads, um, and then the sleeves actually being used as part of the dance, um, connected to the body. Um, so here we see, again, the combination of musicians and dancers, the twisting torsos. Here we see that in addition to um, the twisting actions, and the use of the arms and the heads, we also see elevation happening. So we see these dancers here that are actually part of what they're doing. They're not necessarily displaying their legs, but they're using their legs to create an elevation. And that's part of what's um, the focus of how the dance is able to express the, the music um, in this performance. Um, and here we have a really beautiful example of the opposite, instead of coming down to create movement, the dancer is actually elevating upward. Um, and so these are all different types of dynamics that we can see in these static um, sculptures to help us to start to imagine what the choreography of this Ni Shang Yu Yi Wu might have looked like. Um, and here it's harder to tell exactly what the musicians are playing, but we have the same overall structure. Um, here's a, a, a relief as opposed to a, a statue. Um, and you can see a bit more of the use of the longer scarves here, um, as well as the drum, which we hadn't seen in the previous um, examples. This one's a bit harder to see, but you can see um, what looks like a kong ho or an, uh, an ancient harp. Um, you can see the, the plucked instrument towards the bottom. Um, and then you can see the dancer um, up towards the upper right-hand corner, um, arcing upward. So there's a lot of the use of the torso to create curved lines um, in these statues and in these artworks. Um, and this is a slightly different example. So this is from the Dunhuang um, cave art that's located in northwest China. And I'm sure many of you have seen images from Dunhuang before. Um, there are actually many images of dance within the Dunhuang um, paintings. And there's extensive um, debates, actually, among Chinese dance historians as to whether these are actual documentations of real dancers or if they're imagine, imaginary pictures of the godly realms. Because the actual content of these 
these pictures being religious paintings is actually meant to be not the human world, but the spirit world. And so some um, dance historians argue that they're not actual dancers, they're gods dancing, and therefore we shouldn't think that these are historical documentations. Um, but regardless, we can see that there are many, there's actually a lot of information in these images about what, if they were documentations of real dances at the time, what they might have looked like. Um, it's hard to see the outline of the dancer here, but she's actually standing on one foot. She has the other foot up here. She has one hip out. I'll try to balance here. And then she's holding the pipa, that instrument we talked about, that loop behind her head. Can you start to see the image? And then she has her hip out. So it's this type of an action. This action becomes um, one of the centerpieces of an entire style of dance that's called Dunhuang dance, that's actually taught and performed extensively in China today, um, based on these types of images. But if we look at this sort of as a document of Tang Dynasty music and dance, again, we can see the seated musicians around the side, the dancer in the middle. Um, this is unusual in, this, in the case that the dancer is actually playing the instrument while she dances, which is um, not something we often see. Um, it, we also see the, the tendrils of silk around her body that are actually acting as part of the dance. Um, so if we look at the character um, or the word for what's usually translated as music, um, yue in modern Chinese, this term, um, most historians actually argue, is a term that itself includes dance as part of it. So if we translate it as music, we have to remember that this is music including dance. And this term is something that connects the different performing arts forms across East Asia. So again, if you look at the study guide, you'll notice um, a number of terms that are on the study guide. So we have um, ya yue, or elegant music. And this was a music and dance and performance form that dates back as early as the Zhou Dynasty, so long before the Tang Dynasty. And it was considered to be refined music, as opposed to music that you would find in um, folkloric settings. So it's music associated with refinement and learning. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about this idea of um, the seven, nine, or ten music bureaus. Um, but then once we, we get to Japan, we see the same term um, appearing in the names of the Japanese court music and performance forms. So if we think about this idea of yue as being a complex of what we saw in those images, musicians, playing as dancers dance, interacting with each other. That's what we should have in our minds when we think of this, um, this idea of yue, or music. Um, and then there's one last one that I didn't put on the study guide, but came up in one of the earlier slides, yan yue, or banquet music, which refers to the music that would have been performed and the dances that would have been performed in the formal banquets in the Tang court. And this is what um, Ni Shang Yu Yi belonged to. It belonged to this banquet music that would have been performed for the elites in the court setting. Um, so Erica Brindley, who is a historian of um, performance in early China, actually says that Yue is not only, it not only encompasses the musical performance of song and instrumental pieces, but also includes dances and spectacular visual performances using flags, feathers, costumes, spears, banners, and other props. So this idea of things being brought into the dance is an essential part of this type of performance. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, there's an, an entire poem by Bai Juyi, um, the Tang poet that describes um, the rainbow gown and feathered, um, feathered jacket dance. And he describes the music, but because we know that the music and the dance are so closely interconnected, we can actually learn a lot about the dance from the musical structure. So according to um, his description, there are three parts to this music. There's the loose introduction, or the san shu. Then there's the middle prelude, or the zhong shu. And then finally, there's the po, or the break. So we know that it has this three-part structure. At the beginning, musical instruments did not play together. They came together one after another. So I'm reading from a description that has been adapted from the poem. It's not the exact poem, but it's a summary of the poem's contents. So at the beginning, the musical instruments did not play together. They came in one after another. You can imagine what that would sound like. The instruments were made of metal, such as bells, stone chimes, 
that were hanging by ropes and we struck with a wooden mallet. There were also silk instruments, such as the guqin, the se, the pipa, and the harp. There were bamboo instruments, such as the mouth organ, <clears throat> the sheng, and the flute. They were all played separately and in sequence. So this is all in that, that the beginning, the san shu section. As there was no common meter in this section. So rhythmically, that's probably why it was called san, or dis, um, san just means sort of disorganized or loose. Um, they didn't have a meter in this inter introductory section. To me, it almost sounds like when you're in um, the orchestra and all the musical instruments are starting to warm up, you hear these musical instruments playing, but they're not really playing in a common rhythm. Um, then you get to the middle prelude, which does have a meter. There are very long movements in three subsections, and each of the subsections have different names. Um, probably composed portraying different rhythms with different styles to each section. And this is when the singing would come in. The singing would come in and possibly dancing in this section as well. Um, Bai's poem actually suggests that dance might have been as important as song in this section. It might have come in together with the song. Maybe the dancers themselves were singing. Um, dancers also, it's possible, may have only come in in the final climactic section. Um, so by the time we get to the rhythm of the pua, the final section, the rhythm would get faster and faster. Um, the drums would be particularly important along with the string and wind instruments in this section. It would be more energetic um, even than the middle section. The drums would speed up, the pipa would speed up, um, and dance definitely occurred in this final section of the pua. Um, and at, towards the very end, there would be a stop where all, there would be silence and all the movement and all the music would stop to sort of bring everyone's focus in, and then it would finish in the very, the very final break section. Um, so ethnomusicologists have done a lot of research on, uh, and music historians, on the structure. And so this is one example of a scholar who sort of mapped out the different structure that I just explained. So if you look at the top, you can see the three headings of the three sections. Um, so there was only instrumental music in the, second, in the first section. It was relatively slow. Then we get to the middle section, which has singing, possibly dancing. It has a meter. It has a distinguishable rhythm. And then when we get to the end, um, the last section, there's definitely dancing. Um, and the tempo gets much faster, and it has a definite rhythm. Um, and we want to keep in mind that this piece was created through a mix of existing, existing music and dance styles um, from China along with imported styles from India. Um, so a writer in the Song Dynasty actually said that um, the story of how this piece was created was that someone, this person, Ye Fa Shen, had actually led the Tang Emperor, Xuanzong, to a place called the Moon Palace, um, where he heard some music of um, what was known as fairy music, or a type of Han music from the time. The emperor returned to his palace, but he remembered only half of what he had heard. He then played the music, which he remembered on a flute. At around the same time, another person, a governor from Xiliang, dedicated to Xuanzong the Polo Manchu, that was the Indian uh, Brahmin music, whose melodies were close to what Xuanzong had remembered. Xuanzong then composed the Nichang Yu Yi Da Chu, this uh, Nichang Yu Yi dance that we've been talking about in music, using the music he heard in the Moon Palace in the San Xu and the Pola Manchu in the main section of the piece. So this description suggests that actually that first section was drawn from the existing um, Han fairy music, and then possibly those metered sections that had the, the dance component and the singing component were drawn from um, this in Indian inspiration. One of the things I like about this story is it has this very real moment where he hears something, he goes back home, he kind of vaguely remembers it, and then he uses that as inspiration to create something new. And I think that is a very um, useful and realistic way of thinking about cultural interaction um, in terms of how these interactions really happen. Someone gets exposed to something, they get inspired by it, they don't perfectly reproduce it. And in fact, they probably couldn't reproduce it. But some aspect of whatever that, um, that, that, that thing that left an impression on them, maybe it's the tune that he was humming on the way back from the Moon Palace, that's what finds its way into this new piece that becomes so famous that poets write about it again and again. Um, so Vincent Chung, who's done an elaborate study on this um, composition, argues that the, the rhythm is actually a very important part of what makes this piece so exciting. 
So he writes that, on the whole, the Tang Da Chu is much more aesthetically satisfying as a genre than the Han Da Chu. The structure of the Tang Da Chu is not only more elaborate and more complete than that of the Han, but is also designed to maintain a continuous increase in tempo so that tremendous tension can be built in both the music and the dance in the final section, resulting in an impressive conclusion. The sudden pause in the, this final section before the end also adds stylistic flair to the composition. Moreover, more instruments were employed in the Tang Da Chu, this is compared to the Han version, and the use of foreign musical elements must have given the music an exotic quality unknown to the musicians of the Han Dynasty. This is why the Tang Dynasty was the golden age of this grand genre of music. Um, so this is actually a common argument, not only about music, but also about dance, that part of the reason that the Tang Dynasty was so um, amazing in terms of its dance um, production was actually because it brought, took in all these different styles um, from all the different cultural groups that the Tang was interacting with at the time. Um, and you can see here that the impact on the rhythm and this idea of a growing tempo um, was part of that, what got incorporated into the Tang music from that cultural interaction. So I think we probably have a good idea now of what this piece sounded like. We can at least imagine what it sounded like in our minds. And I think we can get a sense of the overall energy and how it built um, through the piece. But let's go back and think a little bit more about the movement that might have been performed in this um, famous dance composition. So we do have some descriptions of Tang Dynasty dances that do give us a little bit of a sense of movement of some kind. Um, so this is taken from a poem about a different Tang Dynasty dance. So it's not the Ni Shang Yu Yu. It's actually a dance that um, Edward Schaefer calls the Dance of the Purple Culmen. But it gives us something to imagine in terms of how these dancers, usually it was groups of dancers, how they would have been moving in space and creating some type of um, rhythm or stylistic choreography or even shapes of um, ways that the bodies interacted with each other in geometric shapes on the stage. So the poem says, when it begins, the performers advance, side by side, attentive to their tread, following an order as they turn. When they suddenly dip down, we can maybe imagine that dipping action, they lift themselves again. They begin with amiable side glances. We can imagine the heads maybe turning from side to side each treading the next one's footsteps. So we can imagine them sort of walking in, in lines. Always activating their features, taking away, then giving back. They show forth their implements, so they have some kind of props in their hands and utensils with flashing and flaring. They drag along dresses and petticoats in shimmering show. This is the scene, up and down, spinning in a circle, now parted, now joined. And I imagine that actually being the lines of dancers coming out and then coming back together. <clears throat> as gusty as puffs of light and wind, indistinctly a vision of an array of transcendence seeming to bow from twin rainbows, fluttering and tossing in lazy meanders, either drawing back or coming forward. Um, and it goes on, but this is the most vivid part in terms of describing the dance. So there are other details. We, we don't have time to read the entire poem, but this poem goes on to describe um, this dance of the Purple Kalman. And it gives us a sense that there's very elaborate choreography with many, many dancers whose movements are interacting with one another to create some sort of geometrical pattern or some sort of interactive um, choreography that's not just of individual bodies, but actually of bodies arranged in space. Um, it actually takes place in a temple courtyard, so we can imagine that um, as the, the setting. There are rows of banners, racks of lithophones and bells, bands of performers using all these wind and percussion instruments, shimmering costumes, flashing implements, and pheasant plumes. Whirling, bowing, there's something called an Indian file, circling, meandering, joining and separating, darting and retreating, um, geometric symbols, and even the imitations of animals like birds and beasts. We still, I mean, these help us to sort of imagine the movement dynamics, they don't really give us a sense of what the bodies looked like or what the movements or even the lines that they created looked like. Um, so again, I think to try to get it to imagine vividly what the movements were, we have to go back to the visual sources. We can't just rely on the textual descriptions. Um, so again, I'm drawing um, a lot of photographs from Wang Kefen's illustrated history. 
And what I want to do now is have all of us um, experience actually one thing that most dance historians do, which is that we use our bodies actually to analyze what we're seeing. Um, so I don't know how many of you do this, but whenever I go to a museum, like this museum, for example, when I look at a statue, one of the ways that I perceive it and that I try to understand what it is, is I look at it and I try to figure out, by imitating the movement, what's actually going on. So you probably guess what I'm going to ask you to do. I'd like everyone to get up and have enough space that you could do the movements that you see here. So you don't need a whole lot of space. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to show a couple of different slides. And what I want you to do is just pick whatever image on the slide you like, you think is interesting, and try to match that image. So I'll give you a few minutes to pick one. Pick whichever one you're interested in and try to imitate what's happening. So look at where the feet are standing. Look at where the, the waist is in relation to the chest. Look at where the, the shoulders are. Are the shoulders straight or are the shoulders tilted? Is the hand facing forward? Is it flapped back? Based on what you can tell. And then what's happening with the head? Is the head in line with the body? Is it tilted? OK, so now pick a new one and move into the new, the new motion, uh, the, new, the new spot that you find. And if you get bored with one you're doing, you can do a different one. OK, switch. So again, try to think about every part of your body. Where are your feet? Where are your knees? Where are your hips? Where is your waist? Where are your shoulders? Where is your neck? Um, what's tense? What's relaxed? And sometimes what seem to be the simplest postures can actually be quite difficult if you look at the details of what's going on in the image. So this first image, for example, look at how low her shoulders are compared to her head. She's really pulling her shoulders down. Um, and also her elbows are really, really low as well. Um, this one's a fun one. <laughs> and this next one, I don't know if it's humanly possible, so please don't hurt yourself. <laughs> okay, one last one. <laughs> okay, excellent work, everyone. <laughs> Okay, so based on the kinesthetic research that we just did, interacting with these images, what were some of the bodily sensations that made you notice something about, what could you say about Tang Dynasty dance based on what you just did? Any, any ideas? Yes. So, oh, am I allowed to do Q&A right now? I know we have microphones, it's not really Q&A time. Is it okay to do it? Okay, yes, go ahead, just speak up. Twisting. So you felt sort of the twisting in your body somehow. Excellent. It feels like the movement is slow, right? So this is, again, a point of contention among dance historians. Can you really tell the speed of the movement from a still image? So sometimes people look at the costumes. If the costume is flying, then, OK, it means they were moving quickly. It's very hard to tell the speed. But I think you're right. Most people agree that this movement was probably slow. Um, Maybe because the twisting action looks very deliberate. It's, we, I don't know exactly why it seems slow, but most people do agree that this seems slow. Um, any other sensations that you noticed? Yes. It's difficult. Yeah, it's, so a lot of movements that, that ballet, for example, you almost always have your head in line with your body. And even, um, as you know from the introduction, I studied ballroom dance. In ballroom dance, even if you're curving, your head is always going to follow the curve of your body. You would never be like this. This would be totally bizarre. But in some of these images, actually, it's intentional to create a line with the head that's slightly different from the line of the body. And this is indeed something that, when studying Chinese dance, you all, all, at least I always felt like, oh my gosh, I have to pay attention to my head because it's, it's, it's not necessarily in line. Um, the other thing that I noticed, yeah. It's, 
Ex no, they're not necessarily always slow. And I think this one especially, you get a sense that this is not slow. It's, you can kind of imagine them swinging back and forth. Um, so the, the, the tempo would have increased with the, with the music, um, almost certainly. Um, one other thing that nobody mentioned but that I noticed is that a lot of the postures, so this is an example. Um, this is an example, the one in the middle. A lot of the postures have the, the upper torso set behind the bottom part of the body. So the hips are slightly forward. And this allows the chest to become concave. Um, and it creates a very specific posture um, that if you try it, it's kind of unusual, I think, for a lot of people who've studied dance in the West where you're constantly told to stand up straight and, and make sure everything's aligned. Um, so these postures actually have the chest curved in slightly um, and even behind the hips, which is something you also see in paintings from this period, paintings of women in particular. Um, excellent. So I think based on these images, we can draw some guesses about um, the types of dance movements, at least, that might have been present. Um, there are also some documentations in paintings. So this, this position here with the hands behind, this has actually become a, a set dance position in um, Hantang dance, which is a style of dance that's practiced in China now. Um, and again, you can see these a lot of arm twisting, the heads twisting with the arm. These are just common elements that appear again and again. Um, also, the, the movement on the edge here um, of having the body create an arc, this is a movement that also exists in um, Chinese classical dance today um, that's based on a lot of these images, and it's known as the half moon. So you create a half moon with your body, and that's like a standard position that you would find. Um, so we can see a couple more images to, just to sort of see how the movements um, change in different, different parts of China or different time periods. These are all from the Tang Dynasty, though. Here's another example where you can see the legs being used a bit more. Um, and now I want to look at some of the items that are actually in the San Francisco Asian Art Museum collection. Um, and these actually match some of the, um, the images that we just saw, although they aren't the same objects. Um, so for this image, you can see facing straight on, it's kind of hard to tell how the body's standing. But if you look at the side image, you can see that it does have that um, that stance that I was just talking about where the hips are slightly forward and the chest is slightly back, um, and the hands, in this case, they're symmetrical, but um, we saw that there are a lot of other examples where the hands are not necessarily symmetrical. Um, and you can see that the, the shoulders are really far down. And again, the head is not really quite straight. The head is actually curved. Um, so this curved alignment is something that we see consistently in different ways in these, um, in these objects. This is another object from the, this uh, museum collection here. Um, we can see possibly an indication of picking the foot up. It, I mean, obviously the foot's on the ground here, but the way she's lifted her leg, it seems as if she's preparing to do something with her foot. And the sleeves are, are in, act, um, in action here as well. Again, we can see the head sort of doing something different from the body. Um, it's on its own axis. And the shoulders are definitely not straight in almost all of these positions. The shoulders are almost always on some kind of diagonal. And so the shoulders are creating um, their own line as well. Um, and here we can see this, those two objects are actually part of a pair of dancers who appear to be um, dancing in relation to each other, but not identically. And I included this one even though it's not a dance. Um, this is another object from the collection that just shows the, this uh, posture that I was showing a bit earlier um, that you can see not just in dance images, but in images that are believed to just depict um, everyday women. So I want to contrast what we were just looking at with something that is a very different style of movement to try to sort of understand what are the similarities and then how they differ from, from very different movement forms. Um, so this is uh, not necessarily a dance image, but it's um, an image of Krishna, who is a god that's often imitated in Indian dance. So there are many Indian dances where the dancer either engages with Krishna in Indian classical dance or actually performs Krishna in the dance. Um, but I want to look at the body positions here. So one of the things you notice immediately is this extreme turnout, right, in the dancer's hips, knees, and feet. And so this is something we didn't see in any of those Tang Dynasty. All the Tang Dynasty ones were either standing like this or they had their feet together. Um, so really, this is a very different way of using the hips, the knees, and the, and the feet. 
Um, and we see this in many, many statues from South Asian art, and it's also a common part of South Asian classical dance forms, um, where you have this wide turnout in the lower body. You also have um, the arms active, but they're not necessarily active above the head. They're active in the part of the body sort of next to the shoulders. Um, here it's slightly lower, um, but still in that general ra range. Um, and here you see a very similar position. Um, so one of the standard postures that scholars have identified within classical Indian dance forms, particularly Odissi dance, which is the dance form that is considered to be the oldest in terms of archaeological evidence of the eight major styles of um, Indian classical dance, one of the major positions is what's known as the um, tribunga position, and in Chinese it's, it's known as san dao wan, and it's one of the items on your list, um, that basically refers to these three curves. So you can see, some people call it an S shape. So if you look at the curve of the head, that's one curve. Then you look at the curve of the chest and the hip, that's the, the other curve. And then sometimes the, the knee is involved as well. So this S curve line, or th three connected curves, um, becomes one of the ways that when we look at Tang Dynasty dance, we actually identify elements of exchange with Indian music and dance forms. When we see the, the statues start to, like I said, you see the hips jut out, and you see this S-shaped S curve appear. Um, so here you can see there's <clears throat> a couple different dance forms, and the, the one that we're looking at is the one on the far right, where the upper body is actually transposed so that it's not on the same axis as the hip. So it's actually very difficult to achieve, and it takes a great deal of strength in the torso to be able to separate the body in that way, not to mention the strength in the legs um, to be so turned out and so low. And so when we look back at the statues, we can see this position appearing in many of the depictions of um, Hindu deities. And many of the dance scholars who've analyzed the Dunhuang images find this position to be one of the um, consistencies across the images that we find in the Dunhuang dance. Um, and you can see it, the only difference here is that the head is looking down as opposed to being the third curve. Um, but you can definitely see it in the hips and the knees and the torso. So we're almost to our break time, so right before we go to break, I want to show you some examples of contemporary choreographers who've tried to take inspiration from the, the, um, the Nishang Yuyi dance and choreograph it, taking some of these elements. Um, and we can see what they've done, and as you're watching, I want you to think about all the elements that we just talked about and see what you think they're, they're, they're using. So this first example um, is from a film from 1992 called Yang Guifei. And of course you want to look not at only the dance but also the music because they go together. to remind us why she's dancing, right? But here you can think about those descriptions of the bodies moving in space, too. Some of the things we can definitely see are the vertical changes of dynamics up and down in the bodies, um, the use of the arms and the torso as the primary movement focus, and also the head to create contrast with the lines of the torso. Um, the twisting actions and the turning actions being really a central part of the choreography, and of course, the group dancers being arranged in these lines um, and patterns. 
Um, so let's look really quickly at two other examples. So this is an example. This piece was specifically titled Nu Shang Yu Yiwu. So it was meant to, to try to recreate this um, Tang Dynasty grand um, banquet dance. But I'm going to show you a couple other examples that are just taking inspiration from ancient Chinese dance, not specifically that choreography. But I think you can see some of the shared elements. So this is called Chu Yao, and it's meant to be inspired by the um, ancient kingdom of Chu. Um, and it also is inspired by the tomb statues that we've just looked at, but from the earlier period. Um, and this choreographer is listed on your study guide. It's Sun Ying. Um, he developed the dance style known as Han Tang uh, dance in the 20th century, primarily in the 1980s and 90s. Um, and one of his really big um, innovations is that he's changed the dynamics in the way that the torso is moving. So it's not just moving fluidly. He uses a lot of like sudden torso movements and also ways of using the head and the shoulders as a really dynamic movement um, component. So that's one example. Um, here's a, an example. This was um, done by the PLA Performing Arts Academy, the People's Liberation Army Performing Arts School. Um, and it's also taking inspiration from um, the early or medieval Chinese dance sculptures and poems that we've been talking about. So this one you can see uses the short sleeves that we see in a lot of the statues. You can see it's, it's using um, the inward chest that we talked about with the hips forward, and then also using the twisting in the upper body and the hip action as the central focus of the movement. And the feet are really just walking. Um, they're not doing too many um, long lines. There's no turnout um, like we saw in the Indian dance styles. And this example is taking inspiration from the Dunhuang Pipa uh, image that I showed you. And I think you'll be able to easily see um, that position is almost exactly like the position in the Dunhuang image that we talked about. Um, and so this adds in other music or other dance elements from other dance styles that are popular in China today. Okay, and here's the last example. This is from an ensemble based in Taiwan that's led by um, a very renowned dance researcher, Liu Fengxue. And the ensemble is known as the Xin Gu Dian Wu Tuan, or Neoclassical Ensemble. And this choreographer did extensive archival research in Japan. Um, and has taken some inspiration from the Japanese bugaku performances that still take place today. Um, but she's choreographed them um, in the style of Tang Dynasty court dance. This piece is actually performed by male dancers. <clears throat> okay, so now it's time for our 10-minute break. I'll see you all back in a few minutes.